So um, thank you all very much for joining us this evening. Um, we're able to welcome you at the RAS in Stevenson Way, if not to the RAS in Stevenson Way. Um, myself, Alison, Matty and uh, Jung Min are um, here in the RAS reading room. Um, this is our first uh, online collections evening and we are very grateful to you all for attending. Uh, we're especially grateful to each of our presenters, um, two of whom are presenting uh, somewhat locally um, from within the London region, um, and uh, one of whom is joining us all the way from Cambodia. Um, so we're, we're delighted that they can, they can be here this evening. Um, we will be taking a few questions after each of the three presentations and you're welcome to submit your questions at, at any time via the chat function which you should, should see at the bottom of this of the, of the zoom session um, and we will we will forward those for you um and am i you, you can hear me okay okay um, so this event was originally scheduled to take place in March, um, but it was cancelled at the last minute due to the coronavirus pandemic, which had uh, then just broken out. And like most cultural institutions and indeed most businesses, the society was forced to shut its doors for several months. But we have since established a regular program of online talks and lectures. Um, and we have indeed just launched a new YouTube channel where you can find recordings of many of these events. Um, this evening's presentations are also being recorded. Uh, with all the interruptions to the society's activities this year, it's a great pleasure to be able to celebrate some of the wonderful work that has been done with the society's historic collections. Under normal circumstances, the Society welcomes a steady stream of scholars and enthusiasts to our reading room to examine collections which have a major impact on academic research and inspiring cultural creativity more widely. For many years now, we have also hosted a vibrant voluntary program working with numerous placement students and volunteers who have done wonderful work to conserve catalogue and interpret our collections. Many of them have spoken on previous collections evenings. Uh, much of this work uh, has been unfortunately suspended uh, for the last nine months but tonight's event is a great reminder both of what has already been achieved and what we hope to do uh, once more as the external situation improves. Um, I'd also like to emphasize that staff have continued to do as much as possible during the pandemic to look after the collections, to assist researchers and make progress with cataloging and digitization projects even while working from home. Our reading room did reopen one day per week for three months from late July before closing again during lockdown two. And we are hopeful that we will be able to reopen for a few days before Christmas and then again in the new year. Uh, we've also recruited a new archivist, Emma Jones, who took over from Nancy Charlie at the beginning of October. So please do feel free to get in touch with Emma and I, uh, myself, if we can help with your research or answer questions about the collections. Um, so without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, um, uh, Sunitra Seng. Um, uh, Sunitra uh, served as a lecturer at the Department of Archaeology at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh in Cambodia before completing the MA in History of Art and Archaeology at SOAS in 2018-19. Uh, she has conducted a number of archaeological excavations of prehistoric sites in Cambodia and has co-authored a series of books and articles in this field. Sunitra is currently pursuing her PhD at SOAS, 
where her research examines sculpted stone representations of textiles at Angkor Wat, as well as the limited textile remains um, that are available from this site in its environment. Uh, Sumitra received SOAS Alphawood scholarships for both her MA and PhD study. Um, there's clearly a wealth of subjects that Sumitra could address us on this evening, um, but she is going to focus on one, uh, one matter, which is her experience cataloguing and arranging photographs and other materials at the RAS um, from our uh, HG Quaritch Wales collections, um, which is one of our largest multi-format collections of photographs, archives and objects, um, and it, uh, which document Hindu and Buddhist antiquities from Southeast Asia. So I'd like now to hand over to Sunitra to talk to us from, from Cambodia. Hello, can you hear me well? Yeah. Good evening everyone, greeting from Cambodia. I hope I look fresh. It's midnight here but it's also perfect time for me as everybody sleeps, so I can focus on my talk. It's a great honor for me to be invited to give a talk today about my internship at the IS in London last year, to be exact, from November to December 2019. I was grateful to the Southeast Asia Art Academic Program, SAP at SOAS, for providing their generous funding for this 100-hour internship. My greatest thanks goes to the director of the Royal Asiatic Society in London for hosting me and my and another friend in their rich library and archive. I thank Edward Beach and Nancy Charlie for their endless support during my time there. As Ed has just mentioned, I got this scholarship from the Alpha Boot Foundation Chicago to support my study uh, in SOAS, both for master degree and in P and PhD. After finishing my master degree in September 2019, I was also funded to be an intern at the IAS Library in London to learn about archiving, cataloging, and conservation of old photo, glass lights, negatives, and reports. Hey, so Sorry, could you share the screen with us? Ah, yes. Thanks. Sorry. No problem. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, over there I learned cataloging conservation of old photo, glass lights, negatives, and records from Southeast Asia, especially from Cambodia. And that is the reason why I am giving the talk today. My presentation today will focus mainly on the Horace Geoffrey Quaritch Wales Cambodia collection, especially his handwritten journal, which was the record of his trip to Cambodia in the early 20th century. I will conclude this talk with what I have learned from this internship program. I think many of you have known Mr. Wales better than me, but for those who are not familiar with the name, Quaritch Bell was a British historian. He arrived in Southeast Asia in 1924 and worked for the Siamese king from 1924 to 1928. He was interested in archaeological work and he did two excavations, one in Thailand from 1934 to 1936 and another one in Malaysia in 1937 uh, to 1940. During, during this period, Mr. Wells traveled to Cambodia twice in 1926 and in 1933. Besides SOAS Library and the British Library, I have never expected to find such a big collection about Cambodia in London, or maybe I have to search more about this. Anyway, 
this collection had already a must be not only by the number of the object but also by its content. Personally, I have heard a lot about the Khmer artifact and archive in France, and I think not many people could have known about this collection either here in London, in the IS. In addition to some special publications, you can find three albums of photos, hundreds of loose photos, negatives, and glass lights, which are mostly about art, archaeology, architecture and landscape of Cambodia. Some, some interesting book and journal article which could be found in the library are Towards Onko on, on Indian Invaders in 1937, Onko and Rome, a historical comparison in 1965, and recent variety discovery and some Khmer, and some Khmer comparison in 1980. But you can find many more in the library, just us at her. <laughs> there are two handwritten journals about his trip to Southeast Asia in the IS in London. His visit to Cambodia and crossing China from the 27th of November to the 14th of December 1926 was recorded in some 30 pages, volume one, entitled Journal of Travel and Observation. Horus, J of Three, Quaritch Wales, Volume 1, 1923 to 1928. This trip includes the journey to Phnom Penh, the ruins of Angkor, and to Saigon. In addition to the description about the journey, he includes his drawing about the plan of Angkor Park, the ground plan, and longitudinal plan of Angkor Wat Temple. As you can see here, this is his hand. Now, let me uh, show you what I have learned from the internship program. I was lucky enough to be selected to join this internship program, which provide me, provided me a privileged opportunity to work with Nancy and Edward on the collection of Cambodia and Southeast Asia, which I am familiar with. I am happy that I was able to identify some of the material belonging to Cambodia or Southeast Asia, as this is my field of studies and research in SOAS and in Cambodia. I have been teaching uh, archaeology students at the Department of Archaeology at the, Royal, at the Royal University of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh on excavation techniques and conservation of archaeological material. And after this, trend, this internship, I am planning to include the conservation measures of documentation material into my lesson as well. I am also willing to share my experience on cataloging and conservation of documents with museum and library college in Cambodia. At the end of the program, my friend and I were encouraged to install a small exhibition in the reading room of the library. This is again a good chance for us to practice what we have learned at SOAS as we both took curating culture course. And this is what we were trained to do. We decided to choose Quaritch Well collection in, on Cambodia for this little showcase. There were many things we would like to choose from the collection, but due to the limited space of the vitrine, we could only select some, including one handwritten journal, a catalog of Quaritch Wales photo on Cambodian temple, city architecture, village life and landscape. To conclude, nearly all material from Cambodia available in the RAS library and archive had been put online. So I hope more researcher and student can have access and can make use of the collection. I hope most of the material will be dig digitized so that we all have the possibility to see and use them from afar, especially during this unprecedented circumstance we are facing now. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and should you have any question or comment, please feel free to ask or share with me, please. Thank you, Ed and Matthew for the arrangement. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Sinitra, for that wonderful presentation. It's um, it's very uh, gladdening to relive the uh, days of, of uh, the internship that you and Boothney uh, completed uh, at the end, this time last year, um, which uh, feels in some respects very long ago, but in, in others just, just like yesterday. Um, the Alphawood program has been a wonderful way to work with uh, curators and scholars from, from Southeast Asia and, and has also provided a great opportunity to, to learn more about our um, collections of Southeast Asian archives, photographs and, and objects. Um, and uh, in this case, um, to learn a great deal more about the Cambodian collections at the RAS, uh, which is not something which people would, would ordinarily assume that we would have, just like you said. So, so thank you so much. Um, we have a question here from, um, I think that's Liz, uh, Liz Driver um, uh, for Sinitra. Um, could you tell us a little bit, um, a little more about the subject matter of the collection? Um, are you able to to revisit that for, for us for us now? And I'm sorry. Uh, uh, what do you mean by subject matter? Uh, So the, the, what do the photos document? I, I remember they're archaeological excavations um, and historical monuments. Um, I think, were there some of, of the Angkor complex? Yeah, yeah, there, there are photos of uh, mainly the Angkor complex of the temple and the, the uh, city architecture in Phnom Penh as well. And also the village life the living condition of people during that time along the way he visited, especially in Angkor, yeah? And also the landscape, some landscapes. So, uh, Quaritch Wales' work in Angkor, how does that fit historically with the, I suppose, the, the modern archaeological examination of, of the site? What was Quaritch Wales one of the earlier um, uh, Europeans to, to to work there, or have there been a lot of work by by French archaeologists before him? Yeah, yeah, I I, I think uh, his work can yeah like it's something like a uh, different perspective from the French one. I think we I think not many people have known about his uh, written uh, handwritten journal, and I think uh, this this. Uh, could be used like as a uh, material for research about the uh, temple and as well as about some kind of uh, ethnography study of Cambodia during that time, the early 20th century. Um. Emma, Emma, our archivist, has a question, Sonitra, which is, yeah. if, it's, if it's still fresh in your memory, could you uh, tell us what your highlight or favourite thing that you encountered in the Quaritch Wales collection was? Yeah, I, I think my most uh, interesting thing was his uh, handwritten journal. I enjoy reading it, yeah. I, I, I have to read many times more, I think. Yeah, but <laughs> I like it. And I, I was also delighted to see uh, many of the photos from the uh, Java, the temple in Java, Java Island. And yeah, after, after the internship, no, during the internship, I, I was able to visit the, the temple itself and it was very, yeah, very interesting things. That's really wonderful. Um, it's very, very kind of you to join us this evening when it's so late. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. <laughs> well, I, I 
hope you're able to to um, stay for the rest of the event. But I understand if um, if if the, if uh, the lateness uh, means you yeah, have to you have to yeah. leave. Um, yeah, but... I would like to stay more. But if uh, you can't see me anymore, please. Uh... <laughs> Just yeah, don't look for me. <laughs> Well, I'm going to give give you a round of applause anyway, Sinitra. I'm sorry, it's, it's it can't be louder, but thank you thank so you. much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I would like to introduce our second speaker for for this evening, um, which is uh, Aransa Dobbles. Um, who is currently a project conservator at the National Archives, uh, working with their digitization team. Um, she graduated with an MA in paper conservation from Camberwell College of Arts um, last year in 2019. Um, and previous to starting her career in conservation, Aransa graduated from UCL with a BASC in art and sciences. Um, her interest in, in both sciences and arts and their intersection is what drove her to pursue conservation. Um, Aransa will discuss the conservation of several maps drawn by Indian artists in the 1830s, depicting the sacred island of Siva Samudram and the bridge over the Kaveri River. So, hopefully we can hand over to you now hi hi everyone i hope you can hear me well uh, i'm just going to share my screen um i cannot share my screen so if the host could let me do that <laughs> it's okay. nice to um oh oh sorry again? Able, are you able to do it uh no it says that host disabled attendee screen sharing. Um, okay, let, me, let me try and uh, fix that. Yeah, that's all right. It's nice to see some um, familiar names in the audience. That was a nice surprise. <laughs> okay, so I think now I can. I was made cohort. So if I share this screen, share, and then. Can, can you see that? Okay, perfect. perfect. Okay, so I'll, I'll get started then. So like Ed already said, my name is Aranta and I'm a project conservator at the National Archives. The project that I'll be talking about today is something that I worked on last year when I was still a student at Camberwell College of Arts. It was a really exciting project to work on because one of my main interests as a conservator is maps. So it was such a great opportunity and I'm very thankful for Ed and the Royal Asiatic Society that I got the chance to do this and that I get to be here today to show you what I did. So this is the conservation of four maps from the island of Siva Samudram. The island is a sacred island in India which has the Kaveri River in it and the island also counts with a very scenic Siva Samudram Falls, which is actually the falls that you can see here in the background of my first slide. So the four maps are seen here before the conservation treatment. The two maps at the top are an eagle eye view of the island of Siva Samudram, and the bottom two maps are representations of the two bridges that were under construction. One of them was on the eastern side of the Kaveri River and the other one was on the western side. The bridge maps show the plan elevation and shape of the two bridges. And as Ed said, they date from around 1828 to 1830. So the first thing that a conservator does when they prepare to treat an object, or in this case, a collection of objects, is to closely observe and take note of the condition that they're in. In this case, the first thing I looked at was the support, which is paper. The first map, so the one on the top left, is a laid paper support, while the other three maps are wolf paper. This can usually be appreciated when maps or paper in general is viewed through transmitted light, which is not what I'm showing you here, sadly. Uh, and laid paper is when you can see the laid lines, which are vertical lines and chain lines of the paper that are usually transferred to the paper from the hand paper making process. The lines are usually on the mold and then they transfer to, to the paper. 
And then the other three maps uh, are wallpaper, which is, they don't have those lines that I just mentioned. Um, after I have a look at the support, I have a look at the media. In this case, the top left map is hand-drawn in pencil, and the other three are carbon inks. Uh, one of, so there's two different types of inks, or actually probably the same ink, just in a diluted form. One of them is black and the other one is gray. With the map done in pencil, this is a map that I had to be very careful with because as you all probably know, uh, pencil is quite susceptible to being smudged and erased. The particles usually just sit on the surface of the paper, so you have to be very careful because it's a bit more susceptible to information loss and further damage. With the carbon inks, uh, it's interesting how they use them because I think, I'm not completely sure on this, but from what I observed, uh, the lines that you can see that kind of square off the drawings and then the lettering are printed, but the actual drawings were done completely by hand. I did some tests on these inks and it showed that the printed ink, um, which is dark black, was a bit soluble, uh, but the other hand-drawn ink, which is the grayer one, was quite stable. After I have a look at the media and the support, I go on to looking at the damage. So overall the maps I thought were in poor condition. They weren't terrible, but they had a lot of surface dirt that interfered with the information and the text. There were stains present as well as the general discoloration of the paper, discoloration that happens both due to exterior pollutants um, as well as the internal deterioration of the paper from the acids that start to deteriorate, which makes the paper a bit yellower and sometimes gives it that kind of old book or old paper smell. Uh, there's also stains. Um, there were folds, tears and creases, mainly along the edges, which made the handling of the maps a bit difficult and a bit risky. And additionally, that hand-drawn map at the top um, had quite a bit of water damage. The edges were very brittle from this water damage, and it probably caused that dirt to ingrain a bit further into the paper. When paper is water damaged, a lot of the times it happens in a situation when the, the, the water is not very clean water, there might be other dirt floating around. Uh, so when the paper dries a lot of the times, it can become a bit crunchy and it makes it a bit difficult to handle because it can crack. So that's something that I had to look out for. And I have some um, closer up photos of these maps since you can't actually see them in person today. <laughs> I thought it'd be nice to just see them a bit bigger. Uh, you can see that water damaged edge with all those tears and creases. You can see how the pencil has been a bit smudged mainly in that right hand side area as well. In this one you can see on the left side of that map how there's a lot of dirt concentrated in that area. That's probably because of how the map was kept for a long time. Uh, you can see a close-up of my of the tears and the, and the creases. Ooh, and then Oh, there we go. And then these are three pictures. The first one is of the blue stamp that I will talk about a bit later on. Uh, we also have a detail of that hand-drawn uh, work that I was talking about with the black and the gray inks. And then another image in which I was trying to show a bit more of those stains that are not just surface dirt, they're actual stains from something. I don't know what that must have dropped on the map at some point. And so after I look at the condition, I decide what the aims for the treatment are. In this case, I had two of them. Um, the first one was to stabilize the maps for handling and viewing. Before the treatment, as you've all seen, the maps were difficult to handle, they were susceptible to further damage and loss, and particularly that hand-drawn map is what I was quite concerned about. Additionally, the third, the tears and the creases and the folds obscure the information and we want to make it as easily available to the readers and the researchers that come to RAS. From, from these two aims, you can see that my intention was never really to bring the maps back to a perfect immaculate condition. Um, as a conservator, this is never really something that I want to do, as I think that an object's past, past history is also told to its condition. And so in, in my head, you know, maps were made with the intention of showcasing the place or structure, in this case, the island of Siva Samudram and those bridges. They weren't made, or the intention wasn't for them to just look beautiful and be works of art. Um, so that's something that I want to 
maintain and not erase that kind of history and what the maps have gone through. I want to stabilize them, but I don't want to completely erase those little things that have brought them all the way to you know the time and day that they're at now. And with the blue stamp, what I wanted to talk about is that this is something that you're probably all very familiar with. Uh, it's, it's the very common library or museum stamp. They're known as ownership stamps and they're placed on books or items to help establish rightful ownership in case it's ever stolen. They are permanent, but they usually can cause conservators a few problems because they tend to be quite fugitive. And of course it was fugitive, which posed a problem because I had intended to wash these maps. But I will now talk about what I ended up doing in the end. So I had two things to consider when I was writing my treatment proposal. The first one was time. So this wasn't the only project that I was working on at the time. And I think that's true for any conservator and any project out there. You're never just focusing on one thing and you have to, you know, kind of break up your time with, with different uh, things that you're working on and also resources. Uh, this was a project that I did at university and we did have a lot of our uh, at our disposal but you know maybe not to the same level that you would find in a bigger conservation studio particularly in terms of um, I'm thinking analytical instruments and things that I would have maybe liked to analyze the media a bit more or the paper a bit more. Having said that I wrote my treatment proposal according to the condition reports that I had done and talking to Ed as well. And initially I had planned to do an aqueous bath for the documents, which would allow for a lot of that ingrained dirt that I was talking about to come out. Basically when you wash paper, it's done very carefully and in a very controlled way. We first humidify the paper so that when you do immerse it in a bath of water, the fibers have already relaxed enough and they are ready to take on that water. The water then swells the fibers, they open it up and they allow for a lot of that ingrained dirt and acidity to flow out. It's obviously they're really important to then dry and flatten the paper accordingly. But in this case, it's something that I considered, but because of the fugitivity of that blue stamp, it's something that wouldn't have been as easy. I explored the option of applying a consolidant or fixative, which would have protected that stamp from the water and it would have stopped any ink from becoming mobile. But as I carried out a lot of tests um, and also due to those time and resource constraints that I talked about, I didn't find a suitable fixative. And I, th I thought that washing would be a bit too dangerous at the time. Additionally, I would see later on that actually the surface cleaning that I carried out was enough, in my opinion. Um, it did a really good job at removing a lot of that dirt and making the maps lo look a lot cleaner and the information was a lot more visible. So the actual treatment for the maps then was surface cleaning with a smoke sponge and a grated eraser. A smoke sponge is like a rubbery, porous material that picks up dirt really well. And the grated eraser you can see on the screen here, it's exactly what it sounds like. We grate eraser on a cheese grater and you use your fingers or maybe a cotton ball inside some soft muslin to rub it around the paper. And it does a really good job at getting some of that ingrained dirt out. This is something that I did not use for the pencil map because obviously it would have erased some pencil. <laughs> so I did not do that. Um, I then moved on to the humidification of the maps, which I carried out in a cedar wood chamber with an ultrasonic humidifier. It reached a humidity of about 70%, which allows it to relax. And then you can really open up those creases quite nicely. Afterwards, these were flattened with, between um, some felts and blotter. The felts really help flatten the paper, but keep any of that surface texture that might be in there. So in this case, for example, the laden chain lines that are on one of the maps, uh, in some cases, it might be things like watermark, watermarks. After the maps were completely dry and flattened, I carried out the tear repairs, which I did from the Verso. I did this using 9GSM spider tissue, which is a very, very thin type of tissue that is really barely visible once it's on the paper. And the wheat starch paste is created to a consistency in which it's tacky, but not really sticky. This is really important because if you make it too sticky and too thick, then the place where you apply it on the paper will become a bit kind of crunchy and hard and more way more than other areas. So it's important that you get the right consistency of the adhesive. 
and all conservators will know this, but the adhesive is, is preferential for a lot of us because it's reversible, meaning that if you apply some moisture to it, the adhesive will reactivate and the repair can quite easily be removed if needed anytime in the future. As I said, I did the repairs from the Versa only. I did a few, a bit of handling after those repairs were dry and I noticed that I didn't really need to reinforce them from the front, which is quite nice because it really keeps that visual um, kind of clean of anything that might obstruct it. Even though, as I said, the repairs are barely visible, so it wouldn't have been that noticeable. And after they were all treated, I made a new folder for them. Uh, because as you can see on this image, there's a slight crease down the middle of the map. Um, the three big maps were folded in half when they came to me, which is not really a, a bad thing, but I thought it would be nicer since they were nice and flat now to just store them flat. And so before I move on to showing you some before and after photos, I wanted to just talk about the importance of documentation because uh, it's, it's, it's very important. Um, it's important for the conservator so that we know what we have done and we can remind ourselves of the work both during and after the, the project. It's also important for the client to understand the decision-making processes. So in this case, I was sharing my condition reports and my treatments with Ed, and hopefully that was helpful to you in knowing what I was doing and making sure that I wasn't going to completely ruin any of these things. And also it's important for future conservators or curators or owners of uh, the items because in case that the item needs to go um, treatment in the future again or maybe someone wants to actually undo the work that you've done if they know how you've done it and why you did it and it's a lot easier to do that and i have an example here of my um, documentation for that hand-drawn map and actually if i can share I just wanted to share this screen because I think it's just nicer to see it this way. So in this case, I decided to kind of put my condition report and my treatment report together in one file that would have all the information for that particular item. So this is the condition report that I did before starting any treatment with some of my comments. And then afterwards, I added actually all the tests that I did, which in this case were for the incrutativity, which actually says fugitively, but it's fugitivity, and the water absorption. And then I recorded all my treatments, um, how I did them and their duration. And then at the end, I had a little bit of an evaluation of the work and some before and after photos. And I'll go back to my presentation now. No, that's not the presentation. This is the, this is the presentation. Okay, we're back. And so here are my before and after photos of the map. As you can see, this one is a lot flatter. A lot of that dirt has gone. There's obviously still some yellowing along the sides, but it's lessened a lot and, and the, the image is a lot more visible. The humidification really helped that edge become not crunchy at all. It was a lot more easy to handle. And here you can see how the repairs were done from the back. So if hopefully you can see in this image that there's some very thin kind of paper going over those those tears which is that 90 cent spider tissue and here are the other maps um they're much flatter most of that dirt is gone but they still have a bit of that i guess some people would call it patina uh, that shows that they're not just completely new which um i i appreciate in old documents and as I said, they were rehoused in a new folder that would fit all of them with some interleaving layers of bondina so that they would be handled a bit more easily and um, covered um, when they were moving around. And, uh, and, and that's it. They were then returned to the Royal Asiatic Society. So um, thank you for listening and thank you for having me here today for letting me do this project, which was very, very fun. And I learned a lot from <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Saransa. That's uh, so educational. It's an incredible insight into the technical process of conserving um, some really quite um, remarkable, very, uh, they're not, they're not, they're, they're very charming um, and important, but then they're, they're, they're quite under 
understated and, and not very ostentatious, um, but once mm -hmm. you actually start to start to start to engage with them, um, mm -hmm. they uh, well they have a they have a lot to say. Mm -hmm. they're, they're very um, so they they were made by Indian artists mm -hmm. um, and working on the on this uh, uh, project to build a bridge under James Lushington. Um, mm. And the they were published in the transactions of the Royal Asiatic Society, along with um, commentary by Ramaswamy Mudaliar um, on the on the island and the bridge construction project. So it's a very it's a fascinating episode of um, of, of cooperation, if not of not collaboration between Indian artists. Um, engineers and planners with with a British um, authority, I suppose, um, so, uh, produced in it produced in a, in 1830, and so just a sh just a few years after the founding of the RAS. Um, so it's a really it's a really interesting snapshot of um, of, 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 of British India or of Madras of the Madras. Um, uh, area at, at, at the time um, and we're absolutely delighted that you, that you were able to, to stabilize um, these and make them so much more accessible um, for, for researchers in the future so thank you very much indeed you're welcome um, it was it was just really fun and exciting for me to work on so i'm very happy that i got to do it um we do we have Oh, we have a question from from Emma for you, um, which was which is about time scale. Because I saw on the on the um, report, it was from early until late May mm -hmm. last year, wasn't it? But was that were you working on it full time for that, for that no. period? Yeah. So at the time, um, May was at the time where I was also finalizing another project, um, and there were other things happening at Camberwell. We were preparing our final exhibition and there was there was a lot going on actually um so i think in total mm, it was probably about 20 hours that i got spread out over that month um and um yeah it was about five five per map i would say four to five per map um and i there's things, like I said, you know, it could have taken a lot longer if I had decided to wash the maps. Um, it could have taken longer if maybe I had decided for that hand-drawn map to do some infills on the corners that were missing. Uh, but I decided that I didn't really find it necessary in this case. Um, it, it, I don't think it would have helped for the handling. And also I think it would have been a bit obstructive since the paper was um, just had a, a lot of its own character. Um, but yeah, overall about about twenty hours spread throughout the month of May, I would say. Have you found that you've been working on similar uh, pieces in your in, mm -hmm. since you've been at the National Archives? Um, I haven't actually worked on any maps yet, unfortunately. I think I will be working on some in the new year. Um, it looks like, uh, but it, and uh, yeah, so but. But the archives have been working mostly on a lot of volumes, um, a lot of books or documents that were not volumes but were at some point bound for um, better keeping, I guess. Uh, and yeah, so sadly not maps, but hopefully soon. <laughs> One day. Yeah. Fantastic. Um, well, we may get, our, um, because either the next presentation may have some interesting similarities and as yeah. well as contrasts with, with, with yours. So um, perhaps there may be an opportunity to come back um, after Rebecca's presentation as Perfect. well. But I'd just like to thank you again for all of your work with the, with, with the collections and, and for joining us this evening. So thank it's you. It's my again. pleasure. Thank you. Um, so Yes, I'm not going to mute myself. Um, so I would like to introduce our final um, presenter for, for this evening, um, which is Rebecca Harvard. 
Um, Rebecca graduated with an MA in paper conservation with a focus on art of paper from Camberwell College of Art in 2019. Um, she came to conservation after working as an exhibitions coordinator and volunteering with preventive conservation and digitization at a number of heritage institutions, including the Courtauld Institute of Art. Uh, Rebecca has a background in history of art and design, and she currently works as a project conservator for digitization at the National Archives in Kew. So I'd like to hand over to Rebecca for her presentation now. Okay, hi Ed, um, and, and thank you for the introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me to speak as well. Um, hello everyone. Um, so today I wanted to share um, the treatment of two double-sided Indo-Persian manuscript leaves um, that um, the RAS generalistly lent to me um, during my master's in paper conservation, um, from which I, as I'd said, I graduated last year. Um, I wanted to begin a little bit about my research into their materiality, um, which brought to light some interesting questions regarding their age. Um, and then give an overview of the conservation treatment, um, which aims to make them accessible to researchers um, and enable occasional display at the RAS. So I'm just going to share my screen quickly. Can everyone see my screen? That's perfect, thank you. Great, okay. So yes, as I said, um, I'll give a, um, just a brief overview of my research into the materiality um, and about the conservation treatment. So illustrated manuscripts um, are the main form of artistic endeavour produced in workshops at the Royal Courts and for the commercial market. These leaves that you can see here are with miniature paintings and opaque watercolour and metallic pigments surrounded by ruled borders depict scenes derived from the famous Persian story of love and devotion, Layla and Majnun, as you can see depicted in the first and third leaves. Layla and Majnun have been described as the Romeo and Juliet of the East. Majnun, meaning possessed by spirits, falls in love with his cousin Layla, but they are forbidden to marry. Majnun retreats into the desert with only animals as company, as you can perhaps see in the third leaf. While Layla, married to a nobleman but still devoted, dies of a broken heart, Majnun following her to the grave. So the provenance and production of these leaves is quite uncertain, but is suggested to be in North India during the mid 16th to mid 17th century. The distinctly Persian style inscriptions are shown at the bottom of the slide here. An additional painting of the verso of the princely figure of Khorezm Shah on horseback um, can perhaps reflect the spread of the Islamic Empire from Central Asia to India and the resulting movement of Persian artists during the early development of the Mughal Empire in the mid 16th century. It's been suggested that this played a significant role in the development of miniature painting during the early Mughal period where Persian Safavid and Bukhara styles were introduced and began to synthesize with local and regional Indian styles. The regional school of Bukhara painting flourished during the mid 16th century, with Bukhara becoming a significant centre for the production of manuscripts of Persian literature. The possible in, um, influence of Bukhara painting can perhaps be seen here in the elaborate ornamental arabesque decoration, the arch and perhaps the bright colour palette of these miniatures. So the manuscript leaves have very likely been trimmed and are not particularly fine as you can see here, suggested by the tilted laid lines in the paper, which are actually helpfully explained before, and the uneven fibre density visible here in transmitted light. The curvature increasing at the spied edge, in addition to possible guarding remnants, can support their previous bound format. I found the paper was starch sized and smooth, but with off, without the often high burnishing associated with Islamic and Indian papers. Due to pigment abrasion and loss, the features of traditional miniature painting technique are also visible, for example, in the underdrawings in red and black ink, as you can see here. In addition to the expected pigments, such as lead white, 
examination also showed the presence of Indian yellow visible under UV light as a characteristic bright golden yellow as seen here in the bird's beak and can support production in India. Interestingly, however, I found from scientific analysis also identified Prussian blue rather than common Persian pigments such as ultramarine or indigo. This therefore aligns production potentially with the 19th rather than the mid 16th to mid 17th century, particularly when I didn't observe any evidence of reworking of the painting and Prussian blue was not actually synthesized in Europe until the first few years of the 18th century. The degradation of green and metallic pigments, which analysis confirmed to be copper based, formed a key driver in the development of my treat treatment approach. So my approach was driven by two key aims. Firstly, to improve the physical stability of the leaves and enable safer access for researchers at the RAS, for which the Persian manuscript collection is one of its most heavily used. And secondly, create an appropriate storage solution that would enable safer access and also occasional flat display of all paintings. As you can see from the images here, the manuscript leaves displayed a range of physical damage from minor creases and folds to localised embrittlement, fractures and loss, particularly at the foredge, likely to, due to flexing in a bound state. Complete fractures in many areas of the ruled borders made the leaves very difficult to handle and view safely. The damage has also likely been increased by the robust historical repairs that you can start to see in the second and third pictures and the associated moisture due to the use of wet adhesive suggested by the tide lines, localised distortions affecting layers of thin lead white and green copper pigment induced degradation. So my challenges were very, very much ethical, for example, should I remove the historical repairs? and practical in terms of how I could control the moisture. So while generally unsympathetic, um, a number of key findings and discussions during my research led me to the decision to actually retain the historical repairs. So firstly, observation of a number of manuscripts of the period showed a similar style of repair of both this unsympathetic off-white paper and perhaps a more thoughtful retouched paper as seen in the central seen in the central image of one of the leaves and the, also the Shanaba example from Cambridge University on the far right. Research suggested that these are most often seen in Persian manuscripts which have spent time in India, therefore providing some evidence and very important historical evidence. Secondly, as you can see, undesirable pigment loss was also observed due to the prior removal of a repair as seen in the image on the far left. And thirdly, the very strong adherence of repairs following testing with animal glue in areas of crumbling paper with copper pigments would present high risk of further loss through the likely mechanical action and the use of moisture to remove the repairs. A key consideration when deciding on the, present, on the treatment was the presence of the copper pigment induced degradation. So the characteristic signs of this degradation can be seen in the strong absorption of green pigments in UV light, as you can see in the images here, the green discoloration below metallic pigments and corresponding browning and fracturing of the paper. Many conservation treatments, as other answers are touched on, involve the use of water to a greater or lesser extent, from washing to remove discoloration to the use of adhesives, which contain different levels of moisture. Copper pigments can be very sensitive and also can disassociate into copper ions and the acetic acid, which are then available to initiate the breakdown of the cellulose structure of paper via oxidation. Therefore, any treatment that I would need to take would take this into account and I'd have to reduce the levels of moisture. So beginning with the least damaged leaf, my treatment, as I've outlined here, involves minimal surface cleaning, Consolidation, which involves securing and stabilising flaking or lifting areas of paint. Stain reduction, resizing and repair. Today I just wanted to talk about stain reduction repair, which presented the most challenges with the presence of copper pigment induced degradation and the small scale and double sided format. So rigid physical gels, which are stiff like 
jelly-like natural occurring polysaccharides such as agarose derived from algae or seaweed are increasingly used in conservation as a way of delivering and regulating moisture for localised treatment of sensitive objects such as stain reduction. In the case of these objects, due to the proximity of the copper pigments to tide lines and the moisture sensitivity of the paper, a rigid 5% agarose gel was made with a ratio of 80-20 IMS and water. And this was used following testing to reduce tide lines. This ratio helped enough swelling of paper fibres to allow the minimal water in the gel to mobilise degradation, whilst the use of alcohol allowed faster evaporation and reduced the risk of further tide lines and distortion. I cut the gel to shape following a printed scale photo of the object, which was overlaid with a polyester sheet. The challenges for me very much arose from balancing the different absorbencies of the paper in areas of staining with the risk of tide lines and distortion with gels of lower concentrations, which release more moisture. So I used a comparison to a before photo during treatment, which helped me manage my risks. And the results, I think, as shown in these images, were in general beneficial to reducing the overall unsympathetic distractions to our appreciation of these people pieces. So with paintings on both sides of the leaves and embrittlement and areas of loss, it was desirable to find a balance between bridging repairs to more sta stable areas of the paper and the risk of changes to pigment. So the damage areas were supported using a remoistable tissue of lightweight toned Japanese Tenguchio paper and two GSM Berlin repair tissue, which has a very fine, even fibre network, which allows for more contact points with the object. And this enabled adequate but unobtrusive support. So commonly repair, as Aransa touched on, involved using a wet adhesive pasted onto repair paper. But remoistable tissues are pre-made with an adhesive, which we can then tailor as conservators and then reactivate with very little moisture. In this case, for example, I prepared the tissues on a matte polyester drafting paper, which helped me to lessen the adhesive gloss um, for use with more matte pigments. So I used a combination of two adhesives, which was a 3% methocellulose and 2.5 wheat starch paste. So these were used for strength, their stability on ageing and the potential resistance to acetocatalyzed hydrolysis, which is a mechanism by which copper pigments degrade. So due to the prevalence of fractures and areas of copper pigment, I also used an 100% bovine gelatin, partially for its potential to fix or stabilise transition metal ions, such as copper, due to its production conditions. So we're aware that gelatin is generally avoided in the treatment of objects um, with South Asian origin due to the prevalence of faiths such as Islam and Buddhism, for which the use of gelatin would not be permissible due to the potential for porcine derived byproducts or those of bovine origin. However, after discussions with the RAS of the possible benefits of gelatin, the absence of religious imagery or text, which were from a distinctly Persian tradition, depicting scenes from a secular Persian love poem and a Muslim Shah, certified bovine gelatin was deemed acceptable. And I think the treatment shown in these images was felt to be sympathetic and fractures causing shadows was adequately supported for future use with minimal impact. And to support fractures in central areas of the painting, I used um, fibre stitch repairs, which are made using individual fibres which are, um, are wrapped and trimmed and then the ends coated with a small amount of adhesive. Um, these enabled me to form a discrete bridge over fractures in central image areas, as you can see in the stalk's wing here. So following treatment, the manuscript miniatures have been successfully stabilised with the risk of immediate loss and further migration of ions during treatment reduced through the use of controlled moisture methods, such as, my, such as the remoistable tissue and rigid gels. So to enable safer handling and flat display of all the paintings, the loose leaves were mounted using an anti-static acrylic verso or support with a protective cover and they were inlaid into a support sheet as you can see here. So I used, I 
I kind of adapted um, an inlaying method um, to be more sympathetic to the previous bound format of the leaves. Um, so I attach the leaves at the spine edge following existing guard remnants, and which enable me to maintain the visibility of the leaf edges. Um, and this was hoped to aid future historical research in the context of the RAS, rather than just framing the leaves as works of art alone. And this mounting, in addition to storage in a custom portfolio, which I made, as you can see here, um, provides access and study without the need for direct handling of the leaves, as well as protection when it's returned to the storage um, in the mix Solander box at the RAS. Um, it was a real privilege um, to be able to research and treat these beautiful objects. Um, so thank you again, um, Ed and all at the RAS for this opportunity. And thank you for listening. Well, thank you, Rebecca, for that wonderful presentation. We are extremely lucky to have someone with your um, uh, diligence and uh, creativity um, and conscientiousness to, to restore, to look after, conserve this, um, uh, these, these, these miniatures for us. Um, thank I, you. <laughs> <laughs> I really uh, enjoyed your presentation of the complicated technical, professional and artistic considerations um, involved in approaching a project like this um, and, and, the, and the, needless to say uh, it's, it's uh, extraordinary to see the, the difference that this kind of uh, dedicated attention can make to the stability of, of an object like this and the close-up photography is extremely, uh, extremely uh, valuable in that regard so thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you. <laughs> they were lovely uh, to work on. <laughs> oh, I'm also. We're also absolutely delighted uh, by with by the, the housing solution that you um, that you created for them as well, which is a remarkable work of engineering as much as anything else. So, so impressed <laughs> with how it all how it all uh, fits together. Um, so, and, and it will it will keep them in, in in good good condition for many years to come. So, so thank you so much. Um, so we have some um, we have we have some questions have come in during the presentation. Um, let's start with so Liz was asking about um, the historic repairs. I'm not sure whether we can whether how how, how accurately or in much, how in much detail we'll be able to to answer this. But uh, what can we say um, about when and where the historical repairs were carried out? Um, Put you on the spot there. <laughs> I'm really... I mean, like, we, we can we we can start by region or continent, can't we? Um, so we think that they were they were created that they were carried out in in India. Yeah, I presume. I mean, I always I always kind of felt as I was working on them that they were part of a. I mean, this is side side of track, I suppose, but they were part of somebody's um, like. Um, almost like a sketchbook of somebody um, practicing their work. So they were actually working, they were working drawings in a way is how I kind of started to think about them. Um, and that maybe due to their, the different repairs that they were obviously repaired multiple times uh, because they were working documents um, as it were. Um, yeah, in terms of the, I mean, may, maybe based on my research about, um, when they could have potentially been made. Um, so maybe the 19th century, I imagine the repairs were probably done around that time, at a guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would concur. I mean, we, the, this, these kinds of repairs are widely attested in our Persian manuscript collection. And of course, we call it the Persian manuscript collection, but many of the Persian manuscripts are in fact Mughal manuscripts. So many of them are from India. And we, we, have, we have a lot of these kinds of repairs. In, the, in, in that collection um, and yes it's, it's widely carried out between the 17th and 19th centuries and which was of course when uh, 
these these miniatures would have found their way into the RAS collection. Um, well, Matt has already shared the the link to the RAS YouTube page. So thank you for that. Um, Emma was asked. Emma's asking what what types of conservation work you're currently carrying out at the National Archives. I I um. I fear that you're not getting to work on Persian miniature painting. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, I can live and hope for the future. Um, well, I have I I have worked on most recently, um, like Aramsa said, um, we work quite a lot on bound volumes. Um, but I did have the chance recently to conserve um, eleven very large, very cumbersome parchment rolls. <laughs> um, Yes, which were a real challenge because of their size um, and length. I think one, I think one was about eighty meters long. So that was Goodness. that was um, a challenge, and it was parchment. So um, yeah, that was really interesting. And I have worked on some maps, so there is some variety, but no Persian manuscripts. <laughs> Not yet. No, <laughs> maybe some will appear at some point. Um. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Jamie Comstock Skip, which I, 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 may, I think you can probably see these, Rebecca, can't you? About a similar Lovely. illustration in the Bruni Institute in Tashkent. Um, cool. So, um, oh, that's great. I suspect that this is um, th th this is yes. I think that this as uh, as a regional example, I can imagine mm. there be similar similar styles of painting. Uh, from, the, from the Bukhara, or whether this is a quasi Bukhara school um, miniature. Um, well, that's really interesting. I'd like to see that. <laughs> maybe you can get the, the National Archives send you out on a jaunt to Tashkent <laughs> to look at some of theirs. That would be nice. <laughs> Live in hope. <laughs> um, Wonderful. Um, well, we that seems to be it for questions at the moment. If anyone else does have any questions, then please feel free to submit them to us now while we have uh, while we have our pre presenters with us. Um, I would just like to um, say thank you again to to uh, Sunitra, Aransa, and Rebecca for for joining us to. Um, tell us about the work that they have done some time ago now um, and it was of course deeply regrettable that we had to postpone the collections evening from earlier this year but um, oh, I'm absolutely delighted that we could uh, revisit these projects at this time when in, 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 in some respects I think it probably does us more good to, to, to see them again um, after the year that we've had than, than uh, than in, in March, so that we can present uh, appreciate um, the the importance of this kind of, of work um, and how fortunate we were to be able to to do it. Um, and it um, certainly provides uh, plenty of inspiration for um, projects and, and work to to um, try and uh, uh, get on with in the new year. So thank you again. For, for joining us this evening um, and if we if we don't have any more questions um, then and perhaps we have if, we, if, if any of our presenters have any more comments then of course they're, they're, they're very welcome to um, to uh, have the floor before before we sign off um, otherwise I'm at the risk of rambling um, interminably I'm going to try and draw proceedings to a close so um, thank you all again and I hope that we will be able to convene another one of these occasions um, in the new year um, and, um, and 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 when we do eventually have another collections evening um, on site then we will get all of these wonderful objects out again and hopefully we'll be able to invite um, our speakers from this evening to join us in person so that we can thank them in person as well so Thank you all very much and good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.